Good evening. We have a two-hour class tonight, and you will understand, of course, that first of all, you will be lifted in consciousness to the apprehension, the spiritual discernment of that which is revealed. And that which is revealed must be understood to be the working tools. with which we carve out our new and higher consciousness. We understand this, that as humans we live on a material and humanly mental level of life. And this means, first of all, a level of life in which there are two powers good and evil. On the material plane of existence we have two powers in the sense of a greater physical or material force which always overcomes the weaker or lesser material force. On the mental level we have again the more concentrated ability to think and uh, project, overcoming the lesser or weaker or even more ignorant. <clears throat> In uh, advertising, you have an example of how a trained concentrated message thinker can deliver a message and so overcome sales resistance as to be able to sell almost any product regardless of its worthlessness. This is always the stronger mind overcoming the weaker. On the human level of life you always have two powers. And this is the way in which you may know whether you are working through spiritual realization or whether you are still on the level of matter or mind. And that is when you are working from the standpoint of good over evil, when you are working from the standpoint of overcoming, you are still working on the human level. When you come to spiritual realization and demonstration, you come to the realm where there is not one power over another, where you are never dealing with overcoming, where you never use a power. This is important because very often and I come across this constantly, students are working one day with one principle and the next day with another principle. One day they are declaring that God is all and the next day they are using truth with which to overcome error. Now, <clears throat> in the spiritual realm, there are not two powers. There is only one. And so there is no overcoming. 
and there is no rising above. There is no truth over error. There is no good over evil. There is no good or God over devil. There is no overcoming. There is only being. Now, remember that we are dealing with states and stages of consciousness. We are not dealing with right and wrong. We are not dealing with one of these being correct and another one incorrect. We are dealing with states and stages of consciousness and each individual must work from the state of consciousness in which they find themselves at a moment, always, of course, reaching for the stars. Now, there are those who are far better off remaining on the physical level of life temporarily and using their medical remedies and uh, their other material aids to good because <clears throat> their consciousness at this moment does not enable them to embrace the idea of an invisible power, even a mental power. In other words, they cannot conceive of anything as intangible as thought being a power over something as tangible as a lump. They cannot imagine anything as tangible as a right idea, as intangible to sense as a right idea, being a power over something as tangible as unemployment. And until they can begin to vision to the truth that all that you can see, hear, taste, touch, and smell is subject to something that you cannot see, hear, taste, touch, or smell, they are better with their physical life. Now, as they advance and begin to discern within themselves that there is something responsible for all that doth appear, something invisible that is responsible, they may then go to either the mental realm or the spiritual, depending on where they may find themselves in consciousness. Now, on this mental level, you also find good and evil. As far back as uh, Mrs. Eddy's early writings, there is a sentence to this effect, the same mind that can create good can create evil. And as recently as last year, a minister published a book in which he says that you can sit down in front of your plants, your flowers, and by right thinking you can make them grow beautifully, and by wrong thinking you can destroy them. Same thing, the same mind that can think good can think evil. The same mind that can practice mental healing can, if it wants, practice mental malpractice. It has been done. No use denying that. Not only it has been done, it is one of the most ancient teachings, proven teachings, on the face of the globe. Throughout all times, there have been, in uh, Australia, among the Aborigines, there have been those who healed and those who killed. And they both use the same means, the means of the mind. 
not what the mind that we call God or the mind that we call that mind that was in Christ Jesus, just your mind and my mind at its human level, at the level when we can think good or we can think evil. The uh, Polynesians have had their good kahunas and their bad kahunas, and the good kahunas can heal, and rest assured they can do beautiful healing work. But the bad kahunas can kill, and they have killed many. And they both do it through the same means, the power of the mind. Now, this minister was right when he said that you can make your flowers grow beautifully or you can kill them, depending on the nature of your thoughts. He was wrong in one respect. He said you could do it through prayer. And that's absolutely wrong. Prayer has to do with your relationship with God and there's nothing in your relationship with God that will result in death to anyone at any time, nor to anything. But had he used the right term, mental work, or thought, then he would have been correct. You can think rightly and benefit, bless. You can think wrongly and harm. Now, you have all witnessed that. When you have come into the presence of any person whom you recognize to be good, sweet, gentle, pure, and you have felt the lightness and the beauty of their thought and probably even felt a peace in their company, or perhaps gone into the office of some busy executive who was finding things going all wrong and coming out feeling confused and mixed up and shaken. And that's an illustration of what can happen with the human mind on the level of good and evil, which is the human level. Now, as we come into that realm, we find, and this goes all the way back, it dates all the way back from the days of Mrs. Eddy and Mrs. Fillmore and all of the pioneers of the metaphysical healing movements. And you will find that their teaching embodied this very ability to do right thinking and thereby to bless. None of them, of course, visualized that anyone would want to use that ability to harm or curse. But those of you who are familiar with Mrs. Eddy's first edition of Science and Health will remember that she caught some of her students red-handed using this very mental power to harm their patients and to defraud their patients. And she warned against it and gave a whole chapter on the subject of how to protect oneself from uh, mental students who were using their teaching incorrectly. Now, the history of the metaphysical movements is one that bears witness to the fact that there has been almost no instances of the evil use of mental powers. There are, in latter days, a few cases of the use for personal gain, but I don't, do not know of a single instance of the use or abuse of mental powers for anyone's harm, and that's quite a credit to a movement that has had the amount of years that this work has had and the millions of people who have come into it and gone out of it. Now then, let us understand that when we are working on this level of the human mind, we are using the power of thought or right thinking for beneficial purposes, and therefore, therefore we may say that we are using a power, using a good power of mind to overcome an evil condition of mind or matter. The infinite way does not enter 
that plane of consciousness at any point. And that is where students must begin to understand that when they undertake the demonstration of infinite weight principles, they must first of all realize within themselves that they are not going to use a power, that they are not going to try to overcome, to heal, to change, to correct, to improve. Rather, they are going to permit themselves to be used. Now this is your first important point to remember that we are not to sit down to do our metaphysical or spiritual work with any purpose of changing any condition in the world, of improving it, or healing it, or reforming it, or redeeming it. Nor are we sitting down with any idea of using a power for any purpose, regardless of how noble it may be. That is why, or rather that is how it is, that our work has its basis in the subject of meditation. Meditation, when it is rightly understood, has only one purpose, and that is making a conscious link between our outer selfhood, that which we call Joel, with our inner selfhood, that which we call God, but which is nevertheless just one. And that one is God. Now, let us exp explain that in this way. At some time or other, which is really not a time, but an event in consciousness, there is something called the fall of man, or you may call it the experience of Adam and Eve being cast out of Eden, or you may call it the story of the prodigal son. Actually, it makes no difference which way you see this experience. All three mean the same thing. They mean that at one time we were living in God consciousness, in the Father's house. As such, we were children of God, heirs of God, joint heirs to everything and allness. And we lived by the grace of the Father, not by our own wisdom, not by our own strength, not by our own might. We lived only by the grace of God. We were nothing of ourselves, but all that the Father had is ours. All that the Father hath is ours. All that God is, I am. This is back in our original state of spiritual sonship, in which we all are entitled to that jeweled ring and that purple robe. This is where he who became a prodigal was actually a son of the Most High, a regal heir. This is where Adam and Eve, having no mind of their own, lived in an eternal state of Eden, harmony, peace, joy, all as the gift or grace of God. And now the prodigal says, I want to be something of myself. 
So, Father, you give me my inheritance, and I'm going out into the world and be myself. And uh, the prodigal taking his inheritance. But remember this. The inheritance is now finite. Before it was infinite, because regardless of how fast he used it up, it was replaced from his father's house, from his father's storehouse, from his father's consciousness. But now he's cut off from that source. So every time he spends a dollar now, he has a dollar less. Every day he lives, he has one day left, less left to live. Every ounce of muscle he uses, he is one day nearer weakness. Why? There is no replenishment from the divine source. He is now using up that which has become finite. It makes no difference. It may have been $10 million when he got it, but the very next day it was less. So eventually, at that rate, he had to come to where he did come, eating with a swine, and finding that even his father's servants were better off than he. Now, this state of the prodigal is our state as humans. We are born and with a little finite life which has been given to us as our portion, plus a little that we get from eating, drinking, and breathing air, we have a span of three score years, 10, 20, or 30 on top of it, maybe 40 eventually, and then nothing. Because we are using up our supply faster than it is being replenished because we are not at one with our source. Like the prodigal, we have cut ourselves off from it now, this is humanhood. This is what we were born into, and this is what all children are being born into except those whose parents have caught the vision of spiritual oneness and are bringing their children into this world not as heirs of flesh, but heirs of the kingdom. And that, too, has to be done through an act of consciousness. Now... When we discover that we are prodigals, when we discover that we are using up our substance faster than it's being replaced, when we have some ill that cannot be met by ordinary means, or some lack, or some unhappiness, we begin to wonder if there isn't a God, a divine source, to which we can go and unless we come to one of these metaphysical works we are apt to be told about this far off God whom we will meet in the next world <clears throat> after he lets us suffer here long enough and then takes pity on us and calls us home but if we come to one of these newer teachings, we will learn <clears throat> that there is a kingdom of God available, not merely after death, but here on earth. We will learn that this kingdom of God is a very practical affair, that it can translate itself into bodily health, into profitable employment, into an abundant supply of everything from food to dollars and homes and transportation. And the next question is, how do we attain this kingdom of God in action? How do we bring it into manifestation? How do we make contact with it so that it will flow? And the answer, of course, differs 
with all of the metaphysical approaches to truth. Each one has its own way of attaining that goal of spiritual harmony. And I'm speaking only now for the one particular way which constitutes the message of the infinite way. And the reason that I speak of this is that this is my personal life. In other words, what is revealed in these writings may have no relationship to what you've read elsewhere, and in many cases hasn't. But it has this in its favor, that it is my own personal experience, and it has been proved in my own life, and of course in the experience of those, in some measure, who have followed it. Therefore, be assured of this, that I am presenting through these writings only my own personal experience, and in no wise am presenting to you any ultimate message or absolute message or message of any other nature that can be construed as uh, claiming anything for itself other than the fact that it is my own life story. Now, as I came to that place of recognition, recognizing the fact that my outer life was not making me happy. There was enough money in it. There was enough substance. There was enough supply. There was never any lack of that in the days in which I'm speaking. And uh, neither was there any health problem of any magnitude. But there was a lack of satisfaction, of completeness, and that is what turned me in this direction. Now, when the answer finally came, it was that in our conscious contact with our source, the essence of life, the activity of life, the law of life could become manifest in our experience and did. Eventually a, an experience took place in meditation which made the contact, established it. Always remember this, I and my father are one even if I'm down in that pit with Joseph ready to be sold into slavery. I and my father are one even if I'm in prison serving time. I and my father are one if I'm in a hospital dying. But that oneness with God is of no benefit to me. It is only as that oneness is made evident through conscious oneness, through the actual consciousness of that oneness the actual awareness of that oneness, the knowledge of that oneness. It isn't the oneness that does it. It isn't truth that makes you free. It's knowing the truth that enables the truth to make you free. And without the knowing of the truth, the truth can do nothing. And so it is, our oneness with God is not saving this world from battlefields, from epidemics, from poverty. You may think it's strange to talk poverty in the midst of such abundance as we have in the United States, but when I talk poverty, I'm talking from the world standpoint that 60% of the people of the world have one meal a day to eat and a very skimpy one. So there's a tremendous lack and limitation in the world, which we here in this particular part of the world know nothing about, but it does exist. And you say, how can it exist when we are one with God? Well, we were one with God from 1929 till 1939, too, and lacked and limped in limitation. Yes, 
our oneness with God does not save us. It is the experience of the actual contact with God. It is the actual oneness being brought into manifestation that does it. Incidentally, let me say this to you, that many of you as metaphysicians may have wondered often why healings didn't take place when you were busy knowing the truth all of the time. You were knowing the truth morning, noon, and night, and nothing happened. And let me tell you the reason for it. You were just knowing it with your mind. You had no contact whatever with your source. And so all you would do was declaring what would have been the truth if you had had your conscious oneness with God. And so it is. You can go around from now to doomsday saying, I am rich or I am well. You can go around forever and forever declaring that God is love and you can be rotting away at the same time. Nothing happens metaphysically until a contact is made with our source. Nobody in the history of the world has ever reached God through their mind. If God could be reached through the mind, the happiest, healthiest, wealthiest people in the world would be college professors. They have the best minds, certainly the most learned ones. won't help them one bit. You cannot reach the kingdom of God through your mind. You can with the mind, using the mind as an instrument, you can reach the kingdom of God, but you have to be sure that you release yourself from that mind in time. Because no one can reach the kingdom of God through the mind, through the intellect, through knowledge. The kingdom of God has to be reached through the soul, through the spirit, through consciousness, through silence. Silence is really the contact with God. We may use the mind to remind ourselves of truth up to a certain point then we have to stop, listen, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, until something comes into us from deep within us, something that may be referred to as he uttered his voice, the earth melteth. Or, we've heard the still, small voice. Ah, when an actual contact is made with the source of our being, now we begin to live spiritually. Now, the Master, no, Paul vo voiced it this way, I live, yet not I Christ liveth my life. In other words, something wells up here from within me, and it directs me and guides me and governs me, sustains me, feeds me, protects me. I of myself can do nothing and must do nothing except just follow instructions. In other words, the Father speaketh, the Father doeth, I merely follow after. It's the Father that doeth the works. Then there is a complete inner relaxing from personal strain, from personal living. And this with which we have made contact becomes the essence of of our being and the activity of our being. And then, of course, you can see why you have no power to use. Now you are being used by a power. Now there is a power that says to you, walk ye this way, turn ye to the right. 
there is a power within you that when you would drive up Main Street says turn left at the next corner and the next day you read in the paper why you did it and why you obeyed the instructions you received. You find out why it is that so many women who have been housewives and so many men who have been clerks and salesmen and accountants all of a sudden blossom out into metaphysical healers and ministers and leaders. You don't think for a minute that they did that of themselves. If they did, they won't be in it long. But those who do succeed in it, they didn't do it of themselves. There was a call, there was a push, there was a drive from within. And that which drove them out of their ordinary way of life went before them to make the crooked places straight. It opened up one of these, or two or three of these many mansions. I'm thinking now of Joseph. Joseph, who said that God uh, sent him before the brothers into Egypt. The nasty way of being sent. He had to be sold into slavery and then put into prison. But if that's the best way he could hear God's voice, I guess that's the way he had to listen. Probably if he had uh, not been the pampered son, he would have learned to listen to God a little more and might not have had to take that roundabout way. But then who am I to talk? I likewise didn't listen easily. I'm learning. I'm learning. It's getting easier all the time for God to move me around. I give him less of a fight. But all of us are giving God a fight. And the more human we are, the stronger the fight we give God. The more we can relax our humanhood and claim our will and our way and our desire, the more we can hear which way God is moving us. Now, don't think for a minute that this is easy. Don't think for a minute that any of us are susceptible to the voice of God so that we move lightly and easily and progressively upward. Far be it from that. We have hard, hard lessons along the way, not lessons that God is giving us, lessons that we push ourselves into by resisting the movement of God, by not hearing that still small voice. Now, after this experience happened to me <clears throat> that made the change in my life, so that within two days after it I was doing healing work and not knowing how, and within 18 months after it, or less, was told by my associate that I had more patients than I had customers. More people looking for healing than people looking for merchandise. And was pushed out of the business world into this world. It happened because of that experience in meditation in which the contact was consciously established so that I was no longer living in the human world. I was in it, but not of it. The things of the human world which had always attracted me no longer did. The things of the human world that I always enjoyed, I no longer enjoyed. The things of the human world that always meant much to me no longer meant anything. And so it was like living in an in-between world. Not much of this and not much of that and nothing of the real. And uh, it wasn't easy. But it was a complete severance from material consciousness. It was a complete severance from faith and dependence on the visible realm. Now then, the next question that came was this. As I went into the healing ministry, healings came quickly and beautifully to those who came to me, and it wasn't long until a very far and wide practice developed. 
but that it brought with it its troubles because the patients wanted to know how it happened and that was something I couldn't tell them. If I had told them the truth it probably would have confused them because the truth would have been this. When they asked for help I closed my eyes. I waited a few moments sometimes a little longer, sometimes less. And then something like a deep breath would come in there and I'd say, it's all right. And it was. They were either healed or at least they were relieved and uh, either with one of those so-called treatments or sometimes a dozen or two dozen, whatever it took, they were healed. They didn't know how and neither did I. I didn't know why. At that time, I didn't even realize that it was the fact that I had made contact with the source of life. And it was this source doing the works. As a matter of fact, had I been pinned down to it, I probably would have thought that God was healing disease through me. Of course, there is no such thing. Disease has no reality, and therefore there isn't any God to heal it. It is only that when we have contacted the source of reality, the essence of life, which is God, all else loses its reality, its presence, its power. It is not that there are two powers, one overcoming the other. It is only that one is a mirage which we are mistaking for power. And by fighting it, we are perpetuating it. Now, this I didn't know. And so it was that I had to begin to learn what heals, what are the principles, what is doing this. And so ultimately, the word was spoken in my ear, meditation. And so began the practice of meditation or the seeking of meditation until eventually I learned that, con that meditation can be accomplished consciously by us, that when we accomplish it, we have made contact with a presence, an invisible presence that goes before us to make the crooked places straight. It is an invisible presence and a power, and it goes before us to prepare mansions for us. It is a presence that enables us to sit behind closed doors and wait for the world to be the pathway to our door. We do not have to go out and advertise. We do not have to go out and solicit. We do not have to go out and proselyte. We can sit and watch the stream of mankind flow to us. For what? For us? God forbid. That would be getting us into a worse jam than we were before. For that presence, which when it is realized, is a light unto the feet of all those who seek it. Now, the next question. As we begin to meditate, the student says, I find something I never knew before. My head is a boiler factory. As long as my eyes are open and my ears so that I can see and hear all of the blatant noises of this world, I don't know what's going on in my mind. But the moment I shut out the noises of this world, a boiler factory takes over. And it not only makes loud noises, but I thought I was a fairly decent citizen. But now I'm commencing to be aware of sensuality. I'm beginning to be aware of things that I never knew were a part of me. I'm even beginning to, to have fears that I never had before. So I quickly open my eyes and my ears because I don't want to fear when I'm in that silence and don't know what's just around the corner. And so the next question comes then, how can I ever meditate? How can I ever attain 
an inner stillness, an inner silence that will make it possible for me to be still long enough to hear the voice of God, the still small voice, the silence of God. Of course you know, don't you, that in these two hours I'm taking you over a journey of uh, nearly 20 years. We're spanning just about 20 years in these two hours because that little experience that I spoke of, of meditation, which changed my life, actually that only came 13 years after I started seeking for truth. And uh, the first book, The Infinite Way, came 16 years after I was engaged in the healing ministry without ever having taught anything to anybody. Just sitting in an office healing, watching these principles at work, proving them. And so you can imagine that I have to span that 29 years in just a very few brief moments. But eventually, this is what came to light. One, we can all meditate. We can all attain a depth of meditation sufficient to enable us to make contact with the source of our being. Not easily, but it can be done. Second, it can be done by starting with a practice which I call with all due copyright honors to Brother Lawrence practicing the presence now practicing the presence is a discipline It is something that, first of all, we have to consciously make up our mind we want to practice, and then we have to resist all of the temptations that would keep us from practicing it. Because the moment we start practicing it, we'll find how many temptations can come up to take us off the path, and they'll all appear as good, honest excuses, and all reasonable alibis. You'll be surprised how many jackasses fall in the ditch and how many weddings we have to attend and how many mother-in-laws will insist on dying or getting sick or having grandchildren. You'll be surprised how many nice, honest reasons there can be for delaying this practice of the presence until tomorrow. And if all those other things don't come in, a good, nice, juicy headache will. Rightly, to practice the presence of God means to follow out a program. Now, this program you can find outlined more fully in my book, Practicing the Presence, and also in The Infinite Way. There is a chapter on meditation. And then there is the whole book, Practicing the Presence, and this practice begins on waking in the morning. And the very first thing we have to do is to train ourselves to lie still after we've awakened and not jump out of bed, but wait there at least five or ten minutes and begin to realize God. Now, there are no formulas, but there are examples. We might one morning awaken to the realization that daylight is outside, whereas when we went to sleep, it was nighttime and darkness. And then ponder how that happened. How did that darkness disappear and how did that light get here? And then we think of the sun. Yes, but the sun wasn't here, and now it is here. 
And so we begin to realize that there is an invisible force at work which is operating on a 24-hour-a-day basis without any rest and without any Sabbath, constantly at work, bringing day after night and night after day, bringing light after darkness and darkness after night in rhythmical order. Or it may be winter time and snow outside covering everything, and we may look at it and realize that in our ignorance we would have thought that all of nature is barren outside, the trees are bare. It is only because we have some measure of intelligence that we know there is no need to be fearful or frightened because of this barrenness because there is this invisible presence and power at work right now, deep down in the roots, deep down in the ground, and in due time, leaves will appear, and grass, and buds, and blossoms, and fruit, and vegetables, and the cattle on a thousand hills. All of these will appear in their season in spite of the barrenness of present appearances and all of this will take place because there is an invisible something oh some people like to call it nature probably it is who knows we like to call it God because we just take that one word and use it in a general sense to describe the invisible force power presence or law which must be behind all manifestation, regardless of what name or nature it appears as. Well, you know, if we have done that, we're ready to get up. And we have obeyed Scripture. Lean not unto thine own understanding when you're looking out there at the barrenness, but acknowledge Him as being ever-present and performing His function. We come to breakfast. And of course, human belief will tell us that we earned that breakfast. We earned the money that paid for it, or somebody did. Forgetting that if you had all the money in the world, it wouldn't influence a chicken one bit. <laughs> there has to be a God. There has to be something that sets a table in the wilderness. There just has to be. Money never created a drop of milk in any cow in the world. No, you have to acknowledge that there is an invisible presence and power with greater intelligence than we have, far greater. And uh, again, we have practiced the presence of God. Before we leave the house, we must go through a doorway of some kind. And now in our wisdom, we pause. We don't rush headlong out of that door into a traffic jam or a traffic accident. We pause for the realization that the presence of God goes before me to make the crooked places straight that I of my own self haven't the wisdom, the intelligence, the ability to get through this modern-day traffic alone or alive. It takes a divine wisdom to do it for us day in and day out, night in and night out. And so we acknowledge the presence of God as intelligence, as safety, as security. Once, many years ago, right here in Portland, we performed an experiment. I've told this story to students all over the uh, globe. A group of businesswomen were coming to Mrs. Close Center every noon for a 15-minute 
meditation and lesson. And this particular week I was there, so I took the platform. And on Monday I said, let us perform an experiment. As you leave this room, you have to go out to that elevator. Try not to see that man or woman who usually operate it, but look through them, because hidden within them is the presence of God. They too have the kingdom of God within them, although sometimes they don't seem to show it to us. But it's there. And uh, if Peter could look at a Hebrew rabbi and say, Thou art the Christ, let us look at these two people and say also thou art the child of God. We too can learn to look through appearances and see reality. When you go downstairs and out on the street, watch those who are passing. And remember, they're not what they seem to be. They're not men and women. They're not problem children. They're not some good and some bad. Within them is the kingdom of God. Within them is Christhood, divinity. Within each and every one of them is a presence that can lift them out of any problems that they think they're carrying with them. And we carry this on into the restaurant, to the waiters and the waitresses, and into the stores where they traded, and finally back into their own businesses among their fellow employees and employers and so forth. And I want you to know that the first miracle was this. The man on the elevator came to our meeting that night, and that was the first night in all the years I'd been going to Portland. And from then on, he was a regular attendant whenever he could get off of that elevator. And the next day, the girl began. And between the two of them, there was always one or the other at our meetings there in that building. But by the end of the week, these students told us of experiences that they had, experiences that really and truly would well, open all of our eyes to know what happened the moment that they were not seeing good and evil, but were beholding spiritual reality. Now, they weren't using any power to change anybody. They weren't using the power of truth to change anybody. They were merely beholding that which God had created in the beginning and which always existed, even though hidden by appearances. Now, as uh, you follow this practice of the presence, and you have to carry it out in a thousand different ways, until it becomes literally praying without ceasing, you come to a place of inner quiet, inner stillness, and then only are you ready for the experience of meditation. Now we've come to the end of our first hour, and so we're going to have a few minutes of relaxation.